Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. We've got a lot of news to hit this week, so we're going to get right into it. Joining us, as always, is the very experienced, very knowledgeable Miss Miriam McNabb from Drone Life. And Miriam, it seems like there is the hoopla is back on security issues with drones, Chinese drones, American drones, but yet it seems like public safety is still choosing to work with DJI. What do you have this week? So the endless story about which kind of platform is appropriate uh, goes on. I don't think this one will ever end. We've gotten a lot of mileage out of it so far, and we seem to it seems to continue. So this week, uh, AIRT and drone responders released the results of their survey on uh, two public safety UAS programs in the U.S., one of the questions that they asked was, what type of hardware do you use? And the results were just abundantly clear. More than 90% of public safety UAS programs are using DJI drones. Second was Autel. Third, you know, we came in sort of, we have Parrot, we have Skydio. Fleur, Teledyne Fleur is in there in the mix also, but overwhelming majority DJI drones. So, you know, what does this mean for the sector? It's kind of hard to say other than, you know, (laughs) DJI started out dominant. They're the biggest drone manufacturer in the world. They're still the dominant manufacturer in 2021. Whatever other issues sort of evolve and come to light in the drone industry and the drone community, uh, price matters. You know, price and functionality really matters. I also think that the other thing to note is that things don't change very quickly. And um, I always find this really fascinating uh, when I look at these surveys about what what the fleet is made up of. And if you look at sort of national or international surveys, it can be really interesting that like 3DR solos are still on the list. You know, people are still flying these. They haven't even been made for several years. So I think that um, the fleet is slow to turn over. Of course, new public safety agencies are um, starting UAS programs all the time. And so that that does cause some kind of a shift. But the data, at least for this year, is clear. More than 90% use DJI. That's not a slight majority. That's a, that's a, that's a dominant sector there. So. Definitely an overwhelming majority of drones, that is for sure. And I know we're even seeing uh, some other trends, and I'm sure there's some more data out of these surveys to just, you really better understand which DJI drones are being utilized by public safety as we have super powerhouse drones now, like the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advance that has that dual payload. It has zoom video, it has a huge thermal sensor, and so it would be really nice to know if public safety departments are saving money by purchasing those aircraft over, you know, more expensive enterprise uh, drones. So more to learn for sure, Miriam. But that that brings us to our next story, which, as many of you know, if you're following, well, finance or mainstream media or really any news whatsoever, I'm sure you have heard about the infrastructure bill. And it's easy to assume that the infrastructure bill would actually add a huge boost to the drone industry as drones are being used to inspect critical infrastructure all over the country. Yet this may not be the case as, well, this bill might limit who can buy what. Miriam, what's the the story here? Yeah, the infrastructure bill uh, really should help the drone industry to a certain extent. You know, so much of that money is earmarked to improve our nation's infrastructure. And those are things like bridges and railways and roads. And uh, as you and I both know, you know, drones can play a critical role in bridge inspections, road inspections, you know, vegetation encroachment, you name it, drones are being used. And the infrastructure bill is worded in such a way to really encourage the use of new technologies. 
However, bipartisan uh, senator amendment came up uh, last week. So a a Republican and a Democrat um, sponsored a proposed amendment which would limit those drones purchased with infrastructure funding. I want to make sure that I say this correctly of Chinese made drone technology. So it would prohibit the purchase of Chinese made drone technology using infrastructure funding. So hard to say exactly what that would mean, you know, still under discussion. It was generally accepted as, you know, something that Congress felt was uh, necessary, had been an oversight in the original uh, piece and wanting to add. It's hard to say who will receive infrastructure funding. Does that mean engineering firms or inspection firms or contractors who, who receives those fundings yet to see and what kind of an impact that could have? It also prohibits the purchase, not necessarily the use. So really, really hard to say how that could um, play out. But it's yet another kind of move on the part of the U.S. government to limit the exposure to um, Chinese-made technology and uh, possibly to boost the uh, domestic manufacturing capabilities. You know, this brings up a lot of questions, Miriam. Like, does this mean that all drones that contain Chinese parts? Because that that would cover quite the gamut, not just, uh, you know, Chinese manufacturers, but quote unquote, American manufacturers as well. Yeah. So you've really hit on the the problem here is that as these sort of short, broadly worded um, amendments go into place, that leaves a lot of details in a big, big gray area. And um, that's exactly the issue. So uh, the amendment names sort of listed entities, but um you know, we don't know what that means. Does that mean no no Chinese parts? Uh, that's a problem. Does it mean that it has to meet FTC regulations for a made in America? That could mean something different. Um, really problematic when kind of people from outside the industry uh, write regulations. They may be designed to solve one problem and they, and they could uh, – present a whole lot more. Again, uh, like I said, if this funding is earmarked for existing engineering firms and contractors with the government and so forth, they may already have their own fleets. And so this could really end up being much more problematic than I think it sounded when they thought of it. (laughs) So we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely going to be interesting to see how that Uh, turns out. I know there's a lot that's in that infrastructure bill that I think many of us uh, are wondering how it's related to infrastructure, but it will be very interesting as a whole. And that brings us to our next story. As many of you know, Remote ID, well, it was marketed as the first step in many to get us to a world of drone delivery. Yet, as many companies have realized, well, it's a whole lot easier to test drone delivery in other countries, not in the United States. Well, it looks like another domino may have fallen in regards to just how fast I will be able to get my pog juice from Amazon. What's going on here, Miriam? (laughs) All right. I'm sure there's a story there. I don't know what pog juice is. (laughs) I'm not sure I want to ask. Oh, no. It's the greatest juice ever made, and it comes from Hawaii. And I can only get it on Amazon. So, yeah, I just I hope that, you know, one day I can get that drone delivered. But it's like a 10 pound box. So I'm not really sure. (laughs) Okay. So uh, Pog Juice aside, Amazon, uh, Wired Magazine ran a report that uh, suggested that Amazon may be downing its drone delivery fleet. And This is a really interesting story for the drone industry in general. If we go back 
uh, kind of several years. You know, I remember in 2015, for example, writing an article about the amount of money that Amazon was putting into lobbying for drone delivery, you know, lobbying at the FAA, that they were really becoming involved in that regulatory environment. I'm sure that you and I were both at conferences where Amazon representatives got up and presented their concept of a federated airspace. They were really um, pushing for regulations that would enable drone delivery. But along the way, you sort of realize that it's very problematic for a firm like Amazon to not only engage in drone delivery, but engage in drone manufacturing. So I think that this may have been an issue of of them being actually so early in the cycle that uh, they didn't see a readily available alternative made by a drone manufacturer. But Amazon started on this route of uh, developing their own aircraft. And as you know, gravity is a powerful force. Developing an aircraft is not as easy as it may seem. And um, it's problematic. In addition to having to develop and certify their own aircraft, they also um, have chosen to attempt a delivery mechanism that is very challenging. So Amazon has been trying to um, deliver by sort of landing in in people's backyards. That's not something that uh, many other delivery companies are trying to do because that's really problematic. If you're trying to actually land a drone in somebody's yard, you got to be careful that the dog's not running underneath it all of a sudden or the little kid or the stroller or, or, or what have you. There are a lot of obstacles to deal with uh, there. So that's very problematic. And I think third thing that kind of makes Amazon's efforts to drone delivery a little bit problematic are that they really um, don't have a robust network of supply near their consumer. So we know of Amazon's warehouses as being sort of, you know, from where I sit somewhere out there on the, on the West Coast. Certainly they are doing same day delivery in a lot of communities. So in those communities, clearly they have distributed um, centers. But it's hard to go wide scale to do drone delivery when your supply is somewhat centralized. So when Walmart tries to do drone delivery, okay, you know, 90 some percent of Americans all live within 10 miles of a Walmart. They already have a distributed supply. But with Amazon, they need to redistribute their supply to be closer to their consumer in order to fully utilize drone delivery. And that seems to me to be a, a long and complex uh problem for them. So the Wired article did not say that um, Amazon is downing their delivery program. What it did say is that they have all but closed their UK delivery hub. That is where they were doing uh, most of their testing. That's where they first got permission to do their testing. So we'll see what happens. I think that um, we probably all owe Amazon a debt for uh, putting drone delivery into the public uh, mindset here and for really trying to do a lot of the work uh, to get it going. We'll see what happens in the future. You know, their fleet was certified, so they do have a working aircraft. You know, I don't know if they're just going to sort of take a step back and figure out uh, where to do their testing and how they're going to make that work or slow it down. But I do think that other models like Google Wings model of, hey, we're the delivery service and whatever retail uh, partner wants to work with us, that's probably going to be a reality before we see Amazon delivery drones. Yeah, it kind of seems like a roller coaster, Miriam, as I, I know you said that Amazon got their airworthiness certificate for their drones, which it seemed like, well, now the sky is the limit. But if I remember, if it was last year or early this year that it was reported that Amazon Prime Air had cut most of their staff. Uh, yes. So it's, it's really interesting to see where does this really lead to, you know? 
Yeah. And like I said, I think we we all sort of owe a debt to some big companies like Google, you know, the Google spinoff that is Wing now and um, Amazon because they did move the ball forward. You know, it's hard for a smaller company to take the hit for five, six, seven, who knows how many years of development before profitability. Um, So I'm sure they'll get there eventually, but it looks like they may have hit a roadblock. Wow. Well, it should be very interesting to see how this turns out. Also interesting because Amazon, as you know, they utilize UPS, USPS, and FedEx dependent on the product that's being sold. And it makes you wonder, well, are they seeing success with UPS's drone program, with the Google Wing program, with FedEx program? Uh, So very, very interesting. But Miriam, thank you again uh, for keeping us up to date here on the Drone Life News. There's so much going on. Sometimes it's it's hard to, to kind of sift through it all. Next week, I'm really excited to be uh, joining you from AUVSI in Atlanta, and where I'm sure we will have a ton of uh, new news to talk about. Definitely. And I know it's going to be an exciting time this upcoming quarter as there are a lot of new drones coming out. So it'll be a very interesting time as well, which is why all of you are going to want to stay tuned. So don't be afraid to leave us a review or subscribe to the show to well, listen to it first before others. But Miriam, thank you again so much for joining me as always it's uh it's a lot of fun i learn from you every week so i really appreciate it likewise always fun to talk to you paul well thank you miriam that's gonna do it for us today everyone thanks again for joining us for another edition of drone life news we'll see you next time take care